Good morning, everyone. So good to see you. We've got people watching online. Can we just give it up for everyone watching online with us this morning? We are a church not with one location, but we are a church with hundreds of locations in this pandemic world. So I am grateful for uh, all of you. Uh, I just love seeing uh, people begin to return and come back. And so I'm thankful uh, for that as well. Um, today I'm going to wrap up a series that I started a few weeks ago called Three Miles Per Hour. Three miles per hour is the average speed in which we walk. All right, some of you are fast walkers, some of you are slow walkers, but if you take them all together, we walk three miles per hour. And my point in this message and in this series is that uh, is, is that we would take time to slow down in a culture that is rapidly accelerating and change is exponential, all right? And the premise of this series, Three Miles Per Hour, is this, is that Jesus never traveled faster than three miles per hour. Jesus never ran anywhere. Jesus didn't ride a horse. He didn't, he didn't magically appear places. He didn't kind of fly over. He could have, he could have defied gravity. All right. Uh, but he chose to walk. And what you see in the Bible is you see these scenes. You see Jesus go from Galilee to Jerusalem. You see him go from miracle to miracle. And often we don't pay attention to the time of Jesus in between his miracles. But, but a lot of the gospel writers do, like Mark does. Mark tells us what Jesus does. What, what does he do? He goes and gets away to be with God, to recharge and refresh and to be in the presence of God. And the premise of my series is this, is that if you want the life of Jesus, then you must move at the speed of Jesus, that we must slow down and get our life back. I talked about that a few weeks ago. Get our life back, call an audible, you know, declare it, slow down, just begin to understand that the world is moving fast and we must move at a different pace. I shared with you my own problems and issues with anxiety and the world uh, that felt like it was crashing down on me for a season. And three miles per hour is my life and my journey into moving at a slower pace. Last week, I taught you how to lose some friends and gain some real relationships. Uh, and that you were made for community, you were made for a cohort, and you were made for the core. Today, I promised you last week I was going to talk about the crowd there was another circle to the concentric circles of relationship. It's the kind of the crowd. And the crowd has shifted in the last uh, several years. Uh, and, uh, and so I want to talk about that today. The title of my message uh, is uh, Algorithms, Artificial Intelligence, and Your Identity. Yes, I'm going to talk about AI today and how it influences and shapes uh, our lives and perhaps your spirituality. In 1996, there was a groundbreaking event that happened. The world champion chess player, Garry Kasparov, uh, was known not only as the best chess player of his day, but he is largely t considered to be the best chess player in all of history, all right? A and uh, chess is kind of the measure for intelligence in the Western world, all right? And so we kind of, it, it's the ultimate game of strategy. Any chess players here? All right? Uh, okay. <laughs> Some people are like this. He said intelligence and chess in the same sentence, all right? Any checkers players? Come on. All right, a, a few of you, all right. Uh, that, that's about my speed, right? And so, um, and so in 1996, groundbreaking event, Gary Kasparov is challenged to a chess tournament by Deep Blue. Now, Deep Blue is an IBM computer, and it's the first time that, uh, that, that this challenge took place. And so in 1996, the very first match that happened was the first time in human history that a computer outsmarted a human, and Deep Blue won the first match of chess, all right? This is a watershed moment for artificial intelligence because it was from this moment on, and this was, uh, this was a quarter of a century ago, all right? I was a junior in high school when this happened. It has only accelerated uh, the use of artificial intelligence, the use of algorithms uh, in our own life. And so uh, I watched this incredible documentary of, uh, of algorithms and AI being used in, in social media. It's called uh, The Social Dilemma. How many of you watched that 
documentary. A lot of you, it's a great thing to watch, especially if you have kids, especially if you're young. I would encourage you to, to watch this, uh, this documentary. It features several executives from Facebook and Pinterest and Google's uh, former executives that talk about the impact that social media technology has had on society. And, uh, uh, and, and they've talked about the slow, imperceptible change uh, and manipulation of behavior and activity that uh, that technology has had on people. Here, here's how it's happening. Some of you already know this, but AI uh, is listening to you and tracking just about everything that you do. How many of you understand that? All right, because you carry probably one of the most powerful tools in your pocket, uh, your, your phone, all right, and you have it on 24 hours a day, it can track everything that you do, everything that you watch, everything that you browse. Uh, it, can, it can tell what you are uh, paying for things and the people and the news, the kind of things that you read. It is tracking you. Uh, and uh, it is taking the information that it is getting from you and it is selling it to companies. So uh, everyone on their phone has an advertising identifier. It is basically a digital profile of your likes and dislikes. Uh, and, and, and for example, Facebook would use this to sell to companies in order to market to you to get you to buy their product. I don't know if you pay attention to the news and technology, but Apple and Facebook are in kind of this uh, technology wars right now because Apple came out with a latest update that required apps to ask permission in order to track you, not just on that app, but across all your apps on your phone. So up until this, Facebook, for example, I'll pick on them, Facebook uh, could track you not just on Facebook, but on all the apps on your phone, right? No sense of privacy there, and then they sell that uh, to companies in order to market to you to get you to buy something. And uh, how many of you how many of you know that uh, that that even the apps that you're using on your phone they have a way of telling when you haven't used the app for a while. What do they do? They send you a notification. I want to tell you, I my life changed about three months ago when my wife and I deleted notifications on our phone, and I no longer get the little buzz, the little ding. All I have is phone calls and text messages that come through. So if I get a message, if you message me on, on, on some kind of social media, thing, I'm not gonna hear, I'm not gonna read about it or hear about it, and even know about it until I actually go into that app. And it wants to, right? People want to keep your attention. Why? Because your attention uh, is a way to make money. So in this documentary, kind of one of the, uh, the amazing things or the biggest claims um, is, is this, that they said that if you aren't paying for a product, then you are the products of that app. And so uh, you as a human, uh, as a person using an app are the product of the company making the app. We often think, well, it's for our benefit in and maybe it was started that way, but it's actually changed. It's actually changed. And the company paying for the product wants to influence and change the way you think and to change the way you behave, change the way you spend your money and get you to think differently. So why do I think that this is worth talking about to three gatherings, almost a thousand people on a weekend to talk about artificial intelligence? Because I get a front row seat in, the, in people's lives. I, I, see, I, I get to pray with people. I get to hear uh, problems and pain and issues and things that people are facing. And so I, I just get this array of, of what I'm seeing. I've got um, two teenagers, almost two teenagers right now. And I, I, I can see in them and their friends. And, and, and I see what is happening. I have a front row seat. And I see how people are being shaped and influenced. 20 years ago, if I would have preached a message to a bunch of young people, I would have talked about peer pressure. Peer pressure is isn't even talked about anymore, right? Because the pressure you receive uh, isn't really from your peers anymore. It's just kind of from this, uh, this uh, enigma on the outside uh, 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 that we don't even fully understand. So I want to give you a few examples of how we are being shaped by AI and algorithms. And part of this does not mean it's going to go away, but being aware of it will actually help you in understanding 
uh, how it's trying to change you. Are you with me? Some of you thinking, is Aaron a conspiracy theorist? All right? Sort of. All right? <laughs> uh, so, so the first one is this. Uh, is, you can write this down if you're taking notes. It's what I'm calling confirmation bias. Confirmation bias. Uh, every single one of us has a bias. All right? We have prejudice, and we don't often know that we're aware of them. Uh, but, but we have a bias, and, and what social media and technology has been able to do is entrench people further in their biases than any other time in history. So we understand this by reflecting on 2020. Why was 2020 seemingly, at least in my lifetime, I've been alive for 41 years, the most divisive time in American history uh, since 1979? Why, why is that? Uh, and why in 2020, all right, if you talk to people all the way on the right, all right, uh, I'm going to talk about politics a little bit, and you talk to people all the way on the left, they would say something like this, I cannot believe anyone could ever vote for that person, all right? Why is that? Because technology and algorithms, they do this. They track what you're doing and what you're watching, what you're seeing, what you're buying, and they actually want to give you more of that, not less of that. That's why things pop up on your feed and you're thinking, well, why did that, I don't know that person very well, or why did that news site pop up, or that information, or, or, or whatever it is, maybe it's like the next cat video or something, why did that come up? Because it's trying to get you to click on something that you will already understand, you will already like. And so what happens is it goes down kind of this rabbit hole and this rabbit trail and you become exposed to things that are not challenging your biases but actually confirming your biases. And this is why you would think, well, all my friends believe this. All my friends act like this. How could anyone ever think anything different? It's called confirmation bias and it's caused division in friendships and families and even in churches all right in 2020 i had to navigate the most difficult year of my life in leadership different opinions and what people think and people are going to leave if we don't do this and if i don't you know vote for this person or whatever all right it, it's so difficult to manage people's biases because we are being confirmed in them on our social media sites so how does this have to do with our spirituality well, I'll give you an example. Think about uh, sinful patterns and behaviors. This basically takes it to a whole new level because the devil has a tool that can be used in order to get you to do the things uh, that keep you trapped in a sinful behavior. I'll give an example of sexual addiction online. Uh, it is, it is uh, the sin that is plaguing a, a generation, in fact, generations in our culture and our society. Uh, a lot of people come and I pray and I, you know, I want to help people, uh, and, 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 but many people can't escape it. Well, why can't you escape it? Your phone is tracking what you're doing, all right? And, and the devil is using this as a tool because it, the things that you are doing, the more pop-ups, more websites, more images, more things are going to come in your feed. And, and when you Google search things than ever before because it's trying to get you to like the same stuff. So it's almost as if you can't escape it. All right. A lot of people think, oh, I can beat this thing. Well, it's going to be hard to beat when you have your phone in your pocket that every time you open it, the devil wants to cast out a lure in front of you and try to reel you back in. Are you still with me? Uh, not only are our phones tracking our behaviors of what we do, but how many of you know they're also listening to us? <laughs> All right. Uh, we all have like smart uh, technology in our homes that are, a lot of times we think it's only listening when we say the buzzword, but in order for it to hear the buzzword, it's got to be listening all the time. How many of you have ever had the experience, some of you are like, oh, really? Like, <laughs> how many of you, I, I know I had this moment about six months ago, how many of you have ever been talking about something with a friend or a spouse, and all of a sudden, the next day or two days later, something that you're talking about pops up on your social media feed, all right? Uh, I have had, I'm not kidding you, I have had times where Brienne and I are talking about something, uh, and we do Hulu Live, so we have like Hulu for mainly for sports um, and uh, and a commercial I'm not kidding you a commercial of the thing that we just talked about popped up on the screen 
and, uh, and I was talking to one of my friends, and I thought, okay, enough is this. I'm going to unplug all my Alexa Echo things and the thing, and then I'm going to take my phone. I have an iPhone, so I'm going to disable Siri. And I was talking to one of my friends. Uh, he's a police detective. Uh, he works in the, the special investigations unit, specifically in the computer crime lab. And I was talking to him, and I said, you know what? I, I'm going through this, like, this revelation in my life, like, uh, like I'm going to get rid of all technology, and I'm, I'm not going to let anything track me. I'm going to disable my notifications. I'm going to disable Siri because I can't stand that she's listening to me uh, and, and, and the whole algorithms and, and feeding me stuff that is really thinks what I want to know. And I said, so I disabled Siri. He said this. He said, uh, he said, Aaron, he said, just because you disabled Siri, what this does is it disables the user function of it, but it does not mean that Siri is still not listening to you. Oh, come on. I, I can't escape this, all right? Uh, but I will say just knowing that, just knowing that may help us. Here's the second thing that I'm noticing is this compassion fatigue, compassion fatigue. Last week, I talked about Dunbar's number it was 150, uh, and really it's been used as the, uh, the ideal number throughout history, throughout antiquity, that humans have organized themselves around families and relationships, uh, because oftentimes you can't have relationships with more than 150 people, and so that's kind of your network, that's your community. Uh, and everyone has a, a, a capacity of compassion, right? Uh, you, you've got like a, a certain amount of empathy or sympathy that you can give away. And I have found myself in this boat questioning this. Why do I not cry and my eyes water anymore when I see something devastating online? All right, because 20 years ago, you'd hear about something, you'd turn on the news and with your friends or with your spouse, you would shed tears over the death and destruction that you're reading, you're hearing about. But every morning when I pop open the news, what is it? There's famine, there is hurt, there is murder, there is, uh, there, there is just disaster that is happening. And I'm not saying that we should be ignorant about what's going on in the world, but all of that has left my compassion capacity really low for the people in my 150 person network. Are you with me? And so we have compassion fatigue. I wonder why don't I cry anymore? Why don't I get emotional about injustices in the world? Because we, we get so desensitized by seeing all of it. Let me talk about the last one. The last one, many of you know very well, and it's loneliness. It is loneliness. You know, you can have a lot of friends and still feel lonely. You can be married and still feel lonely. Loneliness is an, uh, something that is plaguing our culture. Listen, uh, in 2018, I did a, a series, sermon series called Tribes, uh, and uh, I said this. I said that there is a direct connection between the amount you spend time you spend online and the loneliness that you feel. And now we go into a pandemic, uh, and we're spending more time online than ever before. How do I know that? Because I have four kids. All right, I have four kids, and 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 I, I can tell you, our youth ministry right now is booming. It is booming because teenagers want to be together because they want to be around other people instead of stuck on a computer online, all right? And so loneliness, we're, we're experiencing it, uh, and, uh, and, and the reality is we need to change. Something needs to change. If the world isn't going to change, then we need to change, and we need to be able to recognize and move at a different speed and move at a different pace, Social media, just even think about that word, media that is social, something that was intended for connection and for relationships as actually works towards the reverse. It actually isolates you even more, all right? Uh, what's promised as a utopian uh, idea uh, entrenches us into a dystopian future. Why is this important? Why is this important? Let me, let me kind of bring this all together and where I want to go next. Because our identity is being shaped not by our core, not by our cohort, not by our community, not by our pastors, not by our teachers, not, by, not even by our parents. Our, our identities are being shaped uh, by this thing on the outside, this, this crowd, this bubble, this uh, technology, that, right, that is affirming and confirming you, not in the things that God wants to, but the things that the world wants to. We're living in a culture where we're not getting our identity from those who love us the most. 
We're getting our identity from the things that come across our screen. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of Matthew. And, and Matthew chapter 16. And I, I want to read this. I want to talk. I want to just give you a couple thoughts on it. And then we're going to go into a time of worship. We've I'm going to do something I've never done before, and that's preach short, all right? And so I'm going to end in, in a few minutes, and we're going to go into a time of worship, and we're going to go into a time of prayer. And so I, I just want you to kind of be ready for that, and let your heart just be prepared uh, to, to go into a time of ministry, to be ministered to this morning. And so Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 20, this is what the word of the Lord says. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and so others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? It's interesting because we can read this and think, well, is Jesus desperately wanting to know his own identity and the people around him to affirm in his identity? Like, is he struggling with his identity? No, no, no. This isn't about Jesus. This is actually about the disciples. He's saying there, there are people who say what they think I am, right? John the Baptist, like he's some sort of reincarnation. They're all dead people, by the way. Like, like you, 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 you are a coming back to life of somebody else in the past. But he says, I, but what about you? What about you? Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answers, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Finally, Peter gets something right in his life. All right, the kind of impulsive, insecure leader, right? He's a fisherman, like he just, he's not feeling great about himself. And he just stands up and he says, you're the Messiah. You are the son of the of the living God. Verse 17, and something powerful and profound happens in this moment. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my, by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, name change here, that you are Peter. The Greek word is petros. It means rock. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. What is happening here? Why did Peter need to hear this? In his confession of who Jesus is, Peter gets an identity statement about himself. He says, Peter, you are the rock. You are solid. He goes, in your faithfulness in your future is what I'm going to build my church upon. Do you know that Peter was the first preacher, all right? The first evangelistic message came from Peter. Read Acts chapter 1 and 2. After Pentecost came, Peter gets up and he explains the fivefold gospel, right? That the, the life of Jesus, uh, the death of Jesus, the resurrection, the ascension, and the consummation. And he says, does anybody want in? And 3,000 people come to know Jesus in that day. This is Peter. Why does Peter know, need to know who his, what his identity is? Because Peter's going to go through an identity crisis in his life. At the arrest and, and, and crucifixion of Jesus, what does Peter do? Peter denies that he knows the Son of God. Oh, yeah, Jesus, you're, you're the Son of God, the Son of the, the living God. You are Messiah, but when it comes down to it, when he gets arrested, he says, I don't know that man. Peter goes through an identity crisis, and Jesus knows this. So what does Jesus do? He speaks into the life of, of Simon. He says, Simon, you are no longer Simon. Your name's going to be Peter Petros. You're going you're, you're to be the solid rock in which I build my church. It's going to be your faithfulness. Peter needs to hear this message. Two profound things happen in this book, and we're going to do worship in just a moment, but let me get these out. You can write these down in your notes. Two profound things happen in this passage that I think are true for you and I. The first one is this. My greatest sense of identity is found in the identity of Jesus Christ. My greatest sense of identity is found in the identity of Jesus Christ. More specifically, your identity is found when you identify Jesus as the Son of God. 
That, right there, there's this moment that happens, church, that, that only when Jesus said, when Peter says, Jesus, you're the Messiah, does the Messiah say, and Peter, you are the rock. Your greatest sense of identity will come when you say, Jesus, you are Lord of my life. Jesus, you are the great and glorious Lord. I believe and confess that you are king. And he says, then you are my son and you are my daughter. And he affirms the identity that God has placed within you when you were in your mother's womb. Not only is my greatest identity found when I identify Jesus as the son of God, but my greatest purpose and destiny is found in the identity of of Jesus. What does Jesus do? He says, Peter, he says, what, whatever you bind on earth is going to be bound in heaven. I'm going to give you the keys. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What is he saying? He's saying, you're going to have the power to do here on earth what is happening in the spiritual realities. You're going to be able to bring heaven down to earth when you speak out in my name. Whatever you bind in the physical will be bound in the spiritual and supernatural. So Peter not only gets an identity statement, he also gets his destiny with it. How many people are searching for identity in their destiny? We spend thousands of dollars every year to find out what we're going to do. But the most important question that you can ask is who God made me to be.